Well, thank you guys so much for uh, welcoming me to, uh, to speak this morning, like Pastor Josh mentioned. Uh, Kingsview has supported the, the campus church that I get a chance to pastor for, for years. Uh, and so some of the stories that you're going to get a chance to hear in the next little while, you guys make that possible. Uh, the money that you give, the money that you sow into our students allows us to be able to welcome prodigal sons and daughters home, to get a chance to be uh, a good Samaritan. That's what we're going to talk about this morning. Just to give you a little bit of an overview of, of what it is that, that I do um, on, on a weekly basis, uh, I pastor a campus church called Lifeline. Uh, Lifeline exists at Ryerson University, which is right downtown. Uh, so Young and Dundas is kind of the epicenter of the city, um, right adjacent to the Eaton Center. And so it's a campus of 44,000 students. Uh, those students are from 147 different countries, which means that literally three quarters of the world is represented in one place. And so, yeah, that gets me excited. Like, that's, that's what keeps me up at night, because I remember when God called us there, he was like, why not go to where the nations are already gathered? Because if you can help a student from Jamaica or United Kingdom or Philippines or Nigeria or on and on and on, and you can help them fall just like stupid in love with Jesus, that they will do anything to see his kingdom come, the eternal ripple effect, we're never going to get a chance to fully see that. It's going to grow faster than we can keep track of. And isn't that what we saw in the early church when you read the book of Acts? that the church is growing so quickly that it's difficult to keep tabs on. That's what I want to see. That's what we all want to see. And so uh, that's what I get a chance to do every Tuesday night. We have services uh, in the student center, so in their territory. Uh, we have a service that is, uh, we begin with worship led by students. Uh, I preach a message that is very, like, discussion-based. And so as Pastor Josh mentioned, we'll have students that will, like, throw up their hands and, and ask questions or kind of voice doubts or concerns or, or whatever the case may be, because we want them to chew up scripture. We don't want to force feed them. We don't want them just to open their mouths and swallow it whole. We want them to make it their own. And then we spend time in prayer for, for their needs, for the needs of their friends and their family, for the campus. And then we have dinner together. We get a chance to uh, break bread, as it were. And it's really cool to see how eating with someone allows them to kind of lower their barriers. It, it kind of uh, chisels away at their inhibitions, allows them to be more open and honest. Uh, we also get a chance to do outreach to an organization called Red Frogs, where we serve. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. Um, we do Bible studies that we call living rooms. Everything that we do centers around this ethos of home. We're trying to welcome prodigal sons and daughters home. We're trying to go to, to where students are, and we're specifically trying to reach students who want nothing to do with the church, who do not like the church, who don't know what the church is, who don't like Jesus. Those are the students that I love. Those are the students that I want to see come home. So this morning, putting that on hold for a second, uh, Pastor Josh has asked me to speak about the Good Samaritan. Uh, this incredible parable, as we've going, uh, been going through a series on parables, this parable that we're going to look at is audacious. It is a dangerous story that Jesus weaves. Uh, and so I'd like to get into that together this morning. You can turn there with me in your Bibles, swipe open that application, uh, open your paper Bible if you have one. It's Luke chapter 10, uh, uh, verses 25 to 37. It says, on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied, and how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers and then stripped him of his clothes, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road. 
And when he saw the men, he passed by on the other side. So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, pass by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and the inn took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense that you may have. Which of these three do you think was the neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Heavenly Father, we gather here in these moments because we want to spend time with you. We want to hear from you. We want to connect with you. God, I thank you for your word, for the fact that it's not some old, dead, dusty book, but that it's living, it's alive, it's active, it's real, it's organic, it's authentic. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would do something that we cannot do, that you would say what we can't say. May you cause us to grow. May you have a catalytic effect in our lives, and may we be different than the way that we walked in this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Any time you look at a piece of literature, it doesn't matter if it's Shakespeare or the Bible or anything in between, you can take one kind of sentence out of that literary work and you can twist it and use it to say pretty much anything that you want, which incidentally is one of the criticisms that we hear about scripture on campus all the time, that it has been used out of context to uh, uphold slavery and, and all of these different things. And so every single time we look at scripture on campus, the first thing that we do is we look at the context because the context helps us understand what is the author trying to say and what are they not trying to say so that we ensure that we're cutting to the heart of what this text is trying to communicate to us. So contextually, it's important for us to understand who Jesus is talking to, who this man is. It says that he is an expert in the law. An expert in the law is a kind of lawyer who specializes in the interpreting of the Old Testament and how rabbis apply the Old Testament. In other words, this dude is literally a scripture lawyer. That is what he does for a living. He is even more well-versed in the scriptures than the scribes were. He knows his stuff, every single word. The passage says in verse 25 that, that he's trying to test Jesus. The Greek word used here is ekpraizo, which means to test thoroughly or tempt. Some people believe that there's a connotation here that this expert in the law is trying to trap Jesus, that he's trying to back him into a corner. But more theologians tend to believe that, that he's not trying to trap Jesus. This is coming from a genuine place of uh, question, a question that he actually has, but he's also trying to kind of test Jesus' mastery of of the law, his knowledge of the scriptures. And so we do know that he's testing Jesus to an extreme degree. We also know that, that he calls Jesus teacher. And so that implies some level of respect, that he does see Jesus as a teacher. And again, trying to figure out how much of a teacher is this man? How good is he? And ultimately, it's not the man's motive that is the point of this story. It's what Jesus is trying to get across, what Jesus is trying to convey in this conversation. So we begin with the idea of doing. For us to really understand the parable and what's going on in this passage, we have to look at the two questions that are being asked. The first of which being, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do to uh, inherit eternal life. The Greek word for do used in the original manuscripts is the word poeo, which means to make or to do, and it describes somebody making or constructing, manufacturing, doing, causing. It implies an action. Somebody is trying to build or create something. And so this word that he chooses 
kind of indicates to us that the entire premise that he is setting forth is misguided. That he's trying to ask, how can I earn my way into heaven? How can I uh, do enough things? What is it that I can do? What are the things that I can do to get to where I want to go? by working and constructing and, and creating. And so he makes an assumption there that there is human responsibility in the attaining of eternal life. Now, Jesus' lack of correction here does not mean that he is going along with this man's premise. It's not tacit compliance. Jesus doesn't correct the man outright because he understands where he's at. It's as if Jesus sees right through what the man is saying to his heart. And instead of saying, no, 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 you're, you're, you're kind of off there, he kind of goes about it a roundabout way. Something that will help the man understand even more. And so, as he so often does, Jesus responds to a question with another question. I love that. Jesus says, what do you think the law says. And the man replies with basically, love God and love your neighbors. Jesus says, yeah, you've, you've answered correctly. Do that and you'll live. But again, he knows that the expert doesn't fully get it. See, Pharisees believe that you could earn your way into heaven, that you could earn eternal life. If you did the right things in the right way enough times, you could kind of work off your debt. And so it's as if Jesus is saying, you're kind of half there, but then really not at the same time. Seeing the problem in what he's just said, the expert in the law is trying to justify himself. And so he says, well, who, who's my neighbor then? Because he knows that, that he doesn't love everyone. This, this expert in the law, he's like, oh, no, I've just created a problem for myself. I see where this is going. And so maybe I can limit the list of people that I am supposed to love to the ones that I like. And so he says, who is my neighbor? See, at the time, Jews only saw other Jews as their neighbor. But Jesus takes it a step further, as he always does. And if we're being honest, don't we all kind of do that? Yeah. That we see our neighbors as the people that look and sound and vote and believe and think and act like we do? I know I do that subconsciously most of the time. It's easy to love the people if I narrow down the list to those that I already like. It makes it real, real simple. But again, Jesus sees right to this guy's heart, and he doesn't mince words. He sees that this man is trying to ignore the people who are awkward and messy. And so Jesus begins to weave this dangerous, audacious, outrageous, scandalous, shocking, and uncomfortable story, which will begin with the priest and a Levite. So this guy's walking, this Jewish man, walking down. He's going from uh, Jerusalem to Jericho. It's a long, winding road, 27.3 kilometers of dense, rocky, rough, harsh, curvy terrain. And littered all through that, there's criminals that are looking to rob people. And so the man gets robbed, beaten almost to an inch of his life. And then comes a priest walks down the road, sees him, walks by on the other side. And it's interesting because theologians would tell us that this priest is coming from doing his duties in the temple. So it's almost as if he's a pastor who's just come from like leading a service. They just preached a message. They have uh, offered sacrifices to atone for the sins of the people. They're coming from a spiritual high. And they're walking down the road and they see somebody who is left for dead. Nope, I'm going to walk by. Then comes a Levite. So Levite 
was a, a, a certain kind of person whose job it was to kind of maintain the temple and help in, in keeping order in services. So another like really righteous dude walks by, sees the man, crosses on the other side. These two men are the most revered person in society. They are as close to God as you can get, the best of the best, the cream of the crop. And if we're being honest, they do exactly what was expected of them. They pass by on the other side. They turned a blind eye to desperate need. And so as pious as they were, they were checking all the box except for mercy, evidently. And then comes a Samaritan. It's almost as if Jesus says the word Samaritan in this story, and everybody who hears, oh, a Samaritan. It's almost like a dirty word. A name that you would never say. Literally a chapter before this. In Luke 9, 51 to 56, Jesus himself is going to a Samaritan village, and he has problems. He's trying to minister to them, trying to tell them about the kingdom of heaven. And the Samaritan people, literally verses before, reject him. They say, no, 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 get out. And still, literally verses later, Jesus makes the hero of the story the person from the people group who had just rejected him. Like, mind-blowing. Samaritans were a Hebrew uh, religious sect who had a special focus on Mount Gerizim and who claimed to be the descendants of Ephraim and Manasseh from the 12 12 tribes of Israel. They believed that theirs was the original Mosaic religion. So it's almost like the Samaritans are over here and they're like, we're the real Jews. And the Jewish people are over here and they're like, no, 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 we're the real Jews. We have the true religion. No, 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 we have the true religion. They're fighting over this mountain. They're fighting over theology. They do not get along. And even that is kind of an understatement. They actually hate each other. And so when Jesus again mentions the Samaritan coming, everybody would have thought, oh, this guy's about to like just kick this guy while he's down. He's going to call his buddies, and they're going to make sure he's dead. They think the villain has come into the story. And Jesus completely turns it upside down in the most shocking of ways. But Jesus, Jesus is strategic. He knows exactly what he's doing. And he chooses the most disgraceful, atrocious, appalling, despicable, evil, intolerable, egregious kind of person to be the savior of this story. See, it's stories like this. I don't understand why people think the Bible is boring. Like this book is wild. This is the craziest book ever. Because the God that we serve stoops down to where the lowest of the low are, to where the forgotten and the marginalized and the oppressed are. Ooh, and he gets in there. He gets his hands dirty and messy in the lives of the broken. So we have this idea of sacrifice. This monstrously sinful Samaritan has pity on a dying Jew. He feels deeply for the man which is in stark comparison and juxtaposition to how he was raised. He's raised to hate this man, but instead he feels compassion. And he does what's contrary to the norm. The bandages that this man uses, he likely is tearing off of his own clothing. Nobody just carries bandages around, right? Uh, Maybe you've got a bandaid in your purse, but not like gauze and bandages and salve. He pulls out some wine from his own stash. He pours that on, pulls out his own oil and uses it as a salve puts this guy on his own donkey. In the ancient Near East, the donkey was a symbol of peace. Jesus rides into the city at the beginning of the end on a donkey to usher in peace. So he puts this man on his donkey as if to say, there is peace between us. And then he takes out, takes him first to a and b nice little place, got some biscuits, some crumpets, the whole deal. Make sure that he's taken care of, and he takes out two denarii, which would have been the equivalent of two days' wages. So if we like adjust that for inflation, we're looking at about $200 if he worked a minimum wage job in Canada. 
just whipping out $200, no big deal, throwing that on the table for somebody that he was raised to hate. And that's not it. He doesn't just say, well, you know, I did, did what I could do and I move on. He doesn't just slap on a Band-Aid. Rather, he sees the healing through to the final point. He says, you finish up here. I'm going to come back and I'm going to pay whatever outstanding expenses are left over. We don't know if this is $100 or $1,000. Ultimately, it doesn't really matter. The point is, is that he makes sure the job is finished at great personal expense. I love how scandalous the gospel is. I love how countercultural and how subversive Jesus is. See, to a Jew, there was no such thing as a good Samaritan. It was an oxymoron. Those two things never went together. Jesus could have told this story that the hero was a Jew and the victim was a Samaritan. That still would have been a crazy story. Wow, he loved someone he was supposed to hate. But Jesus is telling this story to Jews, and he's like, no, 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 fam, you guys are not the heroes. The hero is the person who you hate, and they saved you. I imagine that, like, Jesus tells this story and just, like, just drops the mic. I'm not going to do that because I know this is an expensive piece of equipment, <laughs> but just, like, mic drop, boom. And everybody's like, oh, my gosh, wow. Like, this story is wild. And Jesus finishes up by saying, which of those three men did the right thing? Which of these three did what they should have done? And this story is so scandalous that the expert in the law cannot even say the word Samaritan. He could have just said the Samaritan dude. But instead, he says, almost through gritted teeth, the one who had mercy on him can't even say the word. And so Jesus says, go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. See, the whole story centers around two questions. How can I get into heaven? How can I inherit eternal life? And who is my neighbor? And the story that Jesus knits together answers both in spectacular fashion They are both deeply interconnected and inseparable. The second flows out of the third. That we love God and we love people. And our love for people flows out of our love for God. And our love for people shows and is evidence of our love for God. You cannot have one without the other. As Pastor Josh said last week, quoting scripture, faith without works is dead. I don't want to have a dead faith. In this case, literally, that Jewish man would have died if not for works, if not for love on display. By that, I mean this. My love for God is evidenced by my love for people. It is the proof in the pudding. I cannot say that I love God if all of his children are existing in this world and they are struggling and they are suffering and I stand idly by and walk by on the other side of the road. I can't do that. Remember a number of months ago, I was driving to to Ryerson. It was a cold fall day, round about zero. I was driving along the road, and I saw in the corner of my eye this dude that was on the side of the road, and he was thrashing around. And so I slowed down my car, and as I slowed down and got closer, I could see that this guy was having a seizure. So I pulled over the side of the road, put on my four ways, got out of the car. During the time that this was happening, I watched several other people walk by this man. We're talking about a sidewalk that is maybe like from there to there. So for you to walk by somebody that is occupying the majority of the sidewalk, you're kind of doing one of these to get around. While this guy is having a grand mal seizure, thrashing around. And so I come up just as I'm walking uh, up to this man, uh, this, this other woman comes and, and she starts helping him. And he was thrashing so hard that his head was smashing against the pavement and blood was pooling around his head. 
And uh, I don't have first aid training. I have no idea what I'm doing. And he had a backpack. So I slid the backpack under his head so that it would at least cushion the blow. He's foaming at the mouth. The longer that I'm sitting there with him trying to help, the smell of urine mixed with alcohol oozing out of his pores is overwhelming. This man is dirty and disheveled. The classic characteristics of a homeless person. And as this is all going on, we're trying to help this guy. Somebody literally like stepped over his body to get by. So we're trying to help. We, we call 911. And I remember so clearly the ambulance pulled up. They start helping the man. And the paramedic said to me, you shouldn't have done this. He said, this man's blood probably has diseases. You shouldn't have touched him without any gloves. You put yourself in danger. And I remember thinking to myself, so what, what was I supposed to do then? What would have been the correct course? Like, just, just watch? Just step over his body? And then my confusion turned to anger. Because I thought to myself, my Jesus put himself in harm's way for me. He didn't have any gloves on when he hung there on the cross. No gloves, no sanitation, wasn't clean. So how dare I try and wait until I have gloves? That's what Jesus meant when he said, go and do likewise. Get your hands messy. We're called to stoop down to the level of the dying, to pour ourselves out like oil and wine over their wounds, to help the hurting, to, bondage the, uh, to, to, to bandage the broken, to give of our possessions, our time, and our money so that people can be healed. And more to the point, we're called also and specifically to those that we hate. Because again, remember, this is not a Jew to Jew story. This is a Jew to a Samaritan story. They hate each other. And so we're called to love our enemies, those that we don't understand or get along with, those we're afraid of, those who make our lives difficult, to those who may, we may have prejudices towards, to homeless people, to addicts, to atheists, to Muslims, to those who identify as LGBTQ+, to people who we are not conditioned to love. Those are the people that this story is telling us to go to, to serve, to pour ourselves out over. We're called to love the ones that we don't want to. And to do so with action. I used to think that, that God called us to the people that we like. And I read this story. I read the story of Jonah. God called Jonah to a people group who he was racist against. He did not like those people. God does not call us to people that we like all the time. And it's usually not the people that we like that need the most help. It's the people that we hate. Now, what I didn't tell you about that story earlier that sounded, made me look pretty good. What I didn't tell you in that story is that my first three thoughts when I saw that homeless man on the side of the road, my first three thoughts were I'm running late, it's cold outside, and what if something bad happens to me? In other words, when I saw that man in trauma, on the side of the road as I drove by in my comfy car, nice and toasty. The first three things to come to mind were selfish excuses of why I should not help. How to let myself off the hook. My time, my comfort, and my safety. And I'm ashamed of that. I'm ashamed of the fact that me seeing somebody in, in immense need my natural human inclination that came right out was selfishness. Me trying to explain why he was not my neighbor. See, I've been the priest and the Levite in the story probably more times than I've been the Samaritan. That's real talk if we're going to get real this morning. If you are like me, you've had many times where you've seen somebody on the side of the road and you think, I don't got time. It's too cold outside. I don't have money for that. I'm running late. That's my life, if we're going to be real. And if we're going to be really real, 
Sometimes I've been the Jewish man beaten laying on the side of the road, waiting for somebody to help me, hoping, begging, praying, God, send someone for me. I've been every character in that story. And I can feel guilty about the times that I have not done what I was supposed to do. For all the times that I passed up a chance to meet a need. But guilt is useless. It doesn't accomplish anything, and guilt is not from God. Conviction, on the other hand. Conviction draws me deeper into his presence. Reminds me of the fact that I can't change what I did. I'm a new creation in Jesus Christ, but today I can live a different life. Today I can do better. I've found that when I'm connected to Jesus, when I am steeped like tea in his word, when I've spent time that morning in worship, me serving the lost and the broken, me pouring myself out like oil and wine, it becomes a joy instead of a chore. It becomes the natural response. Instead of me trying to, oh gosh, I guess I gotta serve this person. Because I think we initially read that story and we're like, oh geez, gotta expand my list of neighbors. But rather, when we read the gospel, it should give us joy. We get a chance to serve people that are not like us. What a God that we serve, that he cares about them more than we ever will. Connecting with God is and has always been the key. And that is the good news. That we're called to a great adventure. This is not a chore. It's not a box to check off. It is the greatest, wildest adventure. I don't know about you, but I'm looking for adventure in my life. I'm looking for something that I can lay my life down to. Ryerson, the students that we serve, they're not looking for an easy faith. They're looking to come and die. That's what we all want, something that is worth laying ourselves down for. That's what I want. That's what this world desperately desires. And best of all, when I stoop down to serve, he's already there. A number of years ago, I was walking through Ryerson, and, and it can be really hard at times. And, and God gave me this picture, and it was as if he was standing at the center of Gould and Bond, in the center of campus. And he was calling out for his prodigals to come home, but they couldn't hear him. And it was as if he said, David, they can't hear me if you don't speak. They can't hear me if you don't speak, and they're not going to hear you speak unless you serve. Us serving is the only thing that the world cannot, they can't counteract, they can't contradict, they can't argue with. The world has no argument for the towel in the wash basin, as the famous quote goes. And so every time we serve and we pour ourselves out like oil and wine over the bodies of the people that we should hate, it's like a movie trailer that leaves them wanting more. To a world that doesn't want to hear the gospel, we have to give them a reason to want to hear the gospel. To be that movie trailer. I say to our students, your goal as a Christian is to be like a bag of potato chips. That when somebody eats that first chip, you're so salty that they can't have just one. They have to have more. Be the potato chip. That is the goal. I love potato chips. I got a chance to live out my calling at Ryerson University. There is no greater passion in my life besides my family and that campus. That's what keeps me up at night. Those students, I desperately want them to fall in love with him. But who are the people that you're called to? Who are your neighbors? Who are the people who you hate? The people that you're like, oh God, no, no, just no, keep those people over there. Those are the people that he wants you to go to. That's what this word is telling us. So who are those people? Who are those names that even now the Spirit of God is like just whispering to you right now? Those images. My prayer for you is that he singes those into your mind that you can't walk around anymore. You can't pass by on the other side. You can't step over that body. Who are your neighbors? Is it a coworker? The guy who lives across the street? The woman sleeping on the sidewalk? Your friend? Your family member? Who are they? What a glorious calling we have to follow in his footsteps. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much, God, that you saved us when we were the Jewish man on the side of the road that was dying. God, that you poured yourself out over us like oil and wine. God, that you were the salve that healed our wounds. 
that you picked us up. You walked us from where we were to where we are today. Heavenly Father, help us not to be the priest and the Levite. Help us to be the good Samaritan. God, make us incapable of walking by those that we see that are in desperate need. Holy Spirit, may you do a catalytic work in our lives. And as you light us on fire again, may you set us ablaze to the extent that other people in close proximity to us, they fall in love with you because they see that love. They see that passion, Father, for your kingdom that lives might be changed, broken people made whole, and prodigal sons and daughters be welcomed home. In Jesus' name we pray.